Hi folks and welcome back. Uh, this week we are turning back to our topics in epistemology. Uh, we are going to be examining epistemology now from a slightly different perspective, however. We began by looking at Descartes and Cartesian skepticism uh, and at Hume and Humean skepticism. Uh, and both of these accounts are deeply individualistic. Both of these accounts ask what we as individual knowers can know about the world. Uh, but most epistemology uh, in the contemporary period, most epistemologists today, uh, are deeply interested in epistemology as a social practice. We are not individual knowers. Uh, we are knowers within epistemic communities. We form our beliefs within epistemic communities. Those beliefs are held up to the test of reason within epistemic communities. And these epistemic communities are engaged in what I will call epistemic practices. Epistemic practices are norm-governed social practices that human beings engage in. We follow a set of norms uh, or sets of norms that we enforce upon one another. We expect others to comply with those norms and sanction violations of those norms. Those norms govern how we form our beliefs, what we take to be good evidence for a belief, what we take to be rational or irrational, what we will count as fact or not, what we, who we will count as good sources of testimonial knowledge or testimonial information or evidence, and who we won't count as good sources of testimony. All of these things are governed by the epistemic norms of the epistemic practice within which one is engaged. Uh, and we are each members of a variety of epistemic communities. Uh, we engage in different kinds of epistemic practices with these different communities, uh, whether these are your community that you engage with when you are in the classroom and demanding certain sorts of textual evidence for a claim uh, or certain sorts of experimental evidence for a claim, or whether you are with your friends out uh, trying to decide where to go for dinner and you demand certain sorts of evidence uh, for the claim that you ought to go to restaurant A rather than restaurant B, assuming someday we're allowed to go to restaurants again. Um, we're going to begin examining epistemic practices by looking at some of the things that can go wrong within an epistemic practice. We're going to start by thinking about the ways in which an epistemic community and epistemic practice can go awry. This week, our topic is echo chambers and epistemic bubbles. We read a paper this week by T. Wen, uh, and T. Wen uh, differentiates between these ideas of epistemic bubbles and echo chambers. Uh, Often we use these terms interchangeably, and both of them have come into fairly common use uh, over the last few years as we've examined the effects of social media on our knowledge practices uh, in pretty public ways. When wants to uh, be more precise about our use of these terms and go back to the ways in which uh, these terms were originally used, the ways in which they were originally coined. So epistemic bubbles for when are social epistemic structures which uh, have inadequate coverage through a process of exclusion by omission. The idea here is that when one is in an epistemic bubble, uh, one fails to look for certain kinds of evidence, certain kinds of information, or certain kinds of arguments. One just doesn't have access to them because of the bubble one is in. These are not very, these are not pernicious things. Uh, if one got access to this information, if one got access to this evidence, these facts, or these arguments, 
one would examine them and incorporate them into one's beliefs, but the epistemic bubble prevents one from having access to such things. An echo chamber, on the other hand, is an epistemic community which creates a significant disparity in trust between members and non-members. This is much more pernicious. In an echo chamber, if one is, is one, if one is within an echo chamber, one not only fails to have access to uh, certain kinds of evidence, certain facts, or certain kinds of arguments, but one grants no credibility to uh, the speakers who, or the, the authorities or experts who uh, present that evidence or make those arguments, uh, one does not trust those outside of one's own epistemic community or outside of the echo chamber. And so even if one hears these arguments, or if one hears this conflicting, this evidence which conflicts with one's beliefs, uh, one will not accept that evidence. One discounts it immediately because of who it is coming from, that is, a non-member of your epistemic community. So let's start by looking a little more closely at epistemic bubbles. Epistemic bubbles, according to Wen, impose a filter on the uptake of evidence, uh, of facts, of arguments, of beliefs. Uh, an epistemic bubble creates a circumstance in which uh, one lacks coverage reliability. And by coverage reliability, he means that uh, our epistemic practice, or the epistemic community engaged in an epistemic practice, leaves out relevant facts, evidence, and arguments. We just don't incorporate them into our practice. Um, and these epistemic sources, these relevant epistemic sources, are omitted, he thinks, by two primary forces. The first primary force is selective exposure. We choose to seek out like-minded sources of information. Uh, this can happen often by accident. We associate with friends on Facebook uh, or in real life for social reasons. Uh, we think they're funny, we think they're engaging, we think they post, uh, they post cute pictures of their cat. Uh, and so we engage with them for these reasons, but end up also getting our news from them. Uh, we end up getting information, we end up treating them as sources of information. Uh, and uh, we do this in all sorts of different ways. We selectively choose a group of people to engage with for one reason, but then use that group of people for a different reason. We use them as sources of information. And as such, we have access only to information from those who are of, of like mind to us, uh, those with whom we likely already agree. Now, we can avoid this by seeking out information from those with whom we often disagree. We can consume news and information from a variety of sources. But if we're lazy, and let's admit it, we're all lazy from time to time, um, we tend to just consume the information that's in front of us. Um, a slightly more pernicious way in which epistemic, relevant epistemic sources are omitted uh, comes in the form of the informational landscape being modified by other agents. So the idea here is that we are not always in control of who we are associating with. Uh, algorithmic personal filtering of online experiences is a great example of this. When we are on Facebook, uh, we choose who our friends are, but Facebook chooses which of those friends we interact with most often. Uh, Facebook promotes some posts and not others, uh, and we uh, end up seeing uh, the news that not only our friends are posting, but that Facebook thinks we want to see, or that Facebook's algorithm thinks, in big quotation marks, we want to see. 
Um, this can lead to all sorts of problems, but one of them that, uh, that Wen focuses on, uh, he calls bootstrapped corroboration, which leads, he says, to epistemic overconfidence. That is, uh, when we are com continually bombarded with uh, confirmatory information, we're given more and more confirmation of a belief that we already hold, we become more and more sure of that belief. We increase our credence in that belief. Um, and this is problematic when that information is just coming from uh, the same sources, when it's not really corroboration, but rather just repetition. He gives the example, a beautiful example, from Wittgenstein. Uh, Wittgenstein says, uh, we should imagine looking through a stack of identical newspapers. Right? They're exactly the same. And as we're sorting through the stack of newspapers, we treat each next newspaper headline saying that P as a reason to increase our belief that P. We keep, uh, we keep becoming more confident in that belief on the basis of reading it over and over again, even though the source is just the same. That's bootstrapped corroboration, and it can be a really problematic effect of epistemic bubbles. But epistemic bubbles are rather easy to pop. All we need to do is expose members of the network to the relevant facts, evidence, and arguments that have been omitted. Once they've been exposed to those arguments uh, they uh, and examine those arguments, then uh, their, their epistemic bubble well, fails to hold. It, uh, it disintegrates around them, uh, and they integrate those new facts and arguments into, uh, into their, their thinking, into their beliefs. Um, and uh, we might do this by simply exposing them to more information. We might also build better epistemic networks and create a better information architecture uh, we can do this uh, um, of our own volition. We can do this intentionally uh, by following Twitter feeds uh, of people with whom we often disagree or by uh, consuming news from a variety of different sources uh, or by creating Facebook networks uh, that are rich with a variety of different perspectives. Um, and by constructing a better information architecture around us, uh, we can limit the effect of the epistemic bubbles that we inhabit. Uh, we can also do this by uh, politically taking control of the incentives for social media to create uh, these epistemic bubbles. Um, so we can do this by uh, limiting the ability of in, of companies like Facebook to control the information that we're seeing uh, and changing the incentive structure that they face because right now they are incentivized to show us things that we will spend time looking at and that we will click on and those tend to be things that already uh, fit the beliefs that we have that don't challenge our preconceptions. So if there's some way of changing that incentive structure this might lead to, uh, to destabilizing these epistemic bubbles. Echo chambers are a thornier problem. Uh, according to when an echo chamber is an epistemic community which creates a significant disparity in trust between members and non-members. They're created by excluding non-members uh, or this, this disparity in trust, is created by excluding non-members through epistemic discrediting while simultaneously amplifying members' epistemic credentials. This means that those who are non-members, those who are outsiders to this epistemic community, are discredited in intentional ways by members of the community. We are given reasons to distrust them because of certain beliefs that they have, because of certain interests that they represent, because of certain others that they associate with. We are given reason to distrust them. 
while simultaneously uh, we are given reason to trust or amplify the epistemic credentials of members of the group because they agree with us, because they are members of this tribe, because they are to be trusted, we grant them more credibility. We take what they say more seriously. Think here about, uh, about um, talk radio uh, and figures like Rush Limbaugh, or think here about Fox News and figures like Tucker, Tucker Carlson, uh, who, um, and at, at the same, in one of this, in one in the same breath, will work to discredit outsiders from the group, give us reasons to distrust them, give listeners reasons to distrust them, and to grant excess credibility to insiders to the group, to give reasons to trust them. Uh, this also, uh, this, this results from a general agreement, or requires, I should say, a general agreement with some core set of beliefs. This is a prerequisite for membership, uh, and those core beliefs include beliefs that, this, that support this disparity in trust. Uh, so they include uh, beliefs about how credibility ought to be distributed, uh, such that members of one's epistemic community are granted excess credibility and outsiders are granted less credibility pretty much automatically. Uh, when calls this credence manipulation, outsiders are just preemptively discredited, uh, while insiders, um, insiders are granted excess credibility. Echo chambers are much more persistent and pernicious than epistemic bubbles. Simply exposing uh, those who are inside of an echo chamber uh, to uh, conflicting evidence, conflicting facts, or conflicting arguments is not going to be sufficient for disrupting the echo chamber because they already take themselves to have reason to disbelieve anyone who disagrees with them. They already take themselves to have reason to discredit anyone who is not a member of their epistemic community, who does not accept their ideology, who does not hold these core beliefs that they take to be central uh, in determining who is trustworthy and who is not. Echo chambers, unlike epistemic bubbles, are usually non-accidental. They're the product of malicious actors aiming to maintain, reinforce, and expand power through epistemic control. These are ways in which people can be manipulated for someone's own ends, whether that be for political ends or whether that be uh, to advance a conspiracy theory, or whether that be uh, to create a cult. Um, these are the same forces at work. And it's important to note that echo chambers are parasitic upon a perversion of standard and necessary epistemic practices. We all have to choose which groups of people to trust as sources of information, because we exist in an epistemic landscape of hyper-specialization. There is so much knowledge out there that we can't possibly know all of it. We can't possibly figure everything out for ourselves. Moreover, we can't even figure out who has the skills to figure out things for themselves, certain things for themselves. So we have to trust uh, certain uh, or adopt certain heuristics, adopt certain uh, modes of calibrating our trust in particular groups or particular individuals uh, in order to decide whether they are credible sources of testimonial, uh, of testimonial evidence. We often rely on a kind of indirect calibration. We trust people because they have 
certain credentials. We trust people because they've had certain kinds of success. We trust people because certain other people who we trust trust those people. We indirectly calibrate our credence, our credibility assessments of these others. We rely on the credibility assessments that others make of them. We can't help but do this. And we rely on litmus tests. If, for example, uh, to use one's example, uh, someone is uh, engaged in a kind of climate, climate change denial, uh, that I take to be pretty strong uh, reason for not trusting many of the other or any of the other scientific claims that they're making without extra corroboration. Uh, or if someone thinks that torture is acceptable, uh, that might stand as a good reason for me to not trust most of their moral judgments. We use these kinds of litmus tests. And it seems rational to do so because we can't figure it all out on our own. Um, but uh, epistemic, jumped ahead there, um, but echo chambers uh, result from these same practices being used in, uh, in perverted ways. Uh, these same practices being uh, used for uh, ulterior uh, purposes by folks who are trying to maintain, reinforce, and expand power by controlling uh, the epistemic practices of others. Um, they rely on these practices of indirect calibration or these kinds of litmus tests to, to manipulate who will count as trustworthy and who will not. So how can someone escape an echo chamber. Uh, they seem to have a much stronger grip on an individual than an epistemic bubble does. Well, Wen points out that uh, there's, in fact, a possible way, and a way that is evidenced in some stories about the, the ways in which people leave extremist groups like, uh, like uh, white supremacist groups or Islamic terrorist groups, uh, the ways in which uh, in which people leave these groups uh, have uh, some features that are worth reflecting upon when things. So he identifies first what he calls the Cartesian reboot. Here we know the story. This is Descartes' meditation all over again. Descartes worries that all of his beliefs might be false uh, and uh, begins rebuilding the entire edifice of human knowledge upon things he can only believe with absolute certainty. But the Cartesian reboot is impossible. Uh, the history of contemporary epistemology shows us that the Cartesian reboot is impossible because it presumes that we are individualistic knowers and we are not. So what when uh, proposes is what he calls the social epistemic reboot. The social epistemic reboot begins not by throwing everything out, but by aiming to reset one's credentialing beliefs that were problematic, problematically set for you by your epistemic community. So resetting the credentialing beliefs, the beliefs that you rely on when you judge who is credible and who is not, uh, is a way of rebooting one's uh, epistemic position. You begin afresh socially, he says, by reconsidering all testimonial sources with presumptive equanimity. You consider all sources as equally reliable, uh, at least until you have reason to discredit them, at least until you discover some new reason to discredit them. Now, one will also need to do away with all of one's um, pre-existing beliefs, pre-existing commitments, because they may have been uh, formed on the basis of testimony that came from what, what, what one might discover uh, now to be unreliable sources. Um, so this is a, a big lift. It's a big ask of someone. But when things, it's at least possible. 
and he thinks one could be motivated to do this. Um, one might not be motivated immediately because one is within the echo chamber and so one has no motivation, no reason to question uh, the beliefs that one has, to question the, the, uh, the credentialing beliefs that one holds. But if an outsider gains trust, if you come to associate with someone who is outside of your epistemic community, someone who challenges some of the core beliefs of that epistemic community, but who you come to trust for one reason or another, that might motivate you to engage in this kind of social epistemic reboot. So he says the route to undoing the influence of an echo chamber is to work to repair the broken trust between echo chamber members and the outside social world. We work to rebuild these bonds of trust between those within the, uh, the echo chamber and those in the outside social world by engaging uh, in all sorts of different kinds of activities with those individuals by uh, not simply engaging with them to challenge their beliefs, not simply engaging with them to draw out our disagreements with them, but engaging with them in a variety of different contexts so that we can build thick normative relationships with them, so that we can build these relationships of trust with them that then allow us to challenge the beliefs that we think they hold as a result of the echo chambers that they inhabit. So that's Wen's solution here. I want to leave with a question. Are echo chambers really bad? Or is it the fact that the beliefs generated by some echo chambers are false that makes us think that they're bad? So Jennifer Lackey, in the, the short uh, essay that we read from her uh, this week, uh, raises the question of whether we ought to really be concerned with echo chambers uh, or whether, uh, in fact, echo chambers um, are not inherently bad. Uh, they can be bad, but so can a lot of other things. They're nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with an echo chamber if it supports true beliefs, if it supports good epistemic practices or valuable epistemic practices, uh, if it engages in appropriate credentialing of uh, insiders and outsiders. And maybe nothing at all wrong with that echo chamber. Uh, in fact, she says, in some cases, uh, thinking about social media, it gives us uh, better reasons for believing the claims made in uh, a news article, say, that is being shared by a wide variety of people because we think that it's past the epistemic filters that they use. They've judged it to be credible, and they're judging it to be credible uh, is good is at least some uh, reason for us to take it to be credible. And I'm wondering if you think that's right, or if you think there are some problems with that. So maybe that's where we can start our discussion uh, when we meet this week. Thanks. Uh, be well, and I will see you then.